Luke chapter 11, verses 29 through 36. Luke 11, starting in verse 29. When the crowds were increasing, he began to say, This generation is an evil generation. It seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South will rise up at the judgment with the men for this of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, something greater than Solomon is here. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. No one after lighting a lamp puts it in a cellar or under a basket, but on a stand, so that those who enter may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it is bad, your body is full of darkness. Therefore be careful, lest the light in you be darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, it will be wholly bright, as when a lamp with its rays gives you light. This is God's holy, inherent, and inspired word. Uh, may he write its eternal truths upon each one of our hearts this morning. Uh, heard me uh, mention before uh, coaching and learning to coach uh, baseball this past summer. Uh, it was uh, really uh, one of the many lessons I learned just how often, in not just in baseball, but in, in sports in general, we talk about the eyes. Uh, you say to your players, you uh, swung and missed. Why? Because you took your eye off uh, the ball. Some parents would yell from the uh, stands, you know, watch the ball hit the bat, again referring to, to eyes. In football, you uh, hear commentators talk about the quarterback looked off the defensive uh, safeties, and uh, sometimes a receiver will drop the ball because he gets caught looking downfield instead of catching uh, the ball. Uh, uh, elsewhere, you you uh, you know would hear about a big hit, or in, in hockey they never saw it coming. Uh, he uh, saw the defense was out of position. Uh, all these references to uh, the eyes, indeed, eyes play a big part of uh, sports and sport performance. But here in Luke chapter eleven. Uh, Luke is, is talking here, and, and Jesus is talking, as Luke records it, or we should say, uh, about uh, our eyes, but he's talking about a different type of eyes. He's talking about your spiritual eyes, and, and here this morning I'm, I'm going to ask you, how are your spiritual eyes doing this morning? Elsewhere in the Gospel of Matthew, in Matthew 6, 22, says the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then uh, the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? It's the same thing Luke uh, records here slightly differently in verses 33 uh, through 36. Uh, what is he uh, saying here exactly? Well, he is, is calling uh, to us to take account of our lives. Where is your heart focused? In other words, we are ruled and governed. We've talked about this in times past uh, by the desires of our hearts. This impacts and influences everything we think and say and do as individuals. So the question is, what, what is your heart ultimately focused upon? And we've also said in times past that the Bible tells us that, that our hearts are confusing. Uh, it's hard to understand your own heart. And very often we can be deceived. We uh, sometimes will think that we are desiring things of 
uh, uh, God than spiritual things, only to find ourselves in situations where oftentimes we don't act and react in ways that are bringing glory and honor. And oftentimes what this reveals to us is that the eyes of our hearts are not firmly fixed upon where they need to be. Uh, one uh, saint confessed it like this uh, in one of his prayers, God of our life, there are days when the burdens we carry chafe our shoulders and weigh us down. When the road seems dreary and endless, the sky is gray and threatening, when our lives have no music in them. I, I love that expression. Uh, when we take our eyes off uh, God, off Jesus. It's as though there's no music, there's no spring in our steps, in other words. He goes on to say, and our hearts are lonely and our souls have lost their courage. Notice what he asks for here. Flood the path with light. Run our eyes to where the skies are full of promise. Tune our hearts to brave music. Give us the sense of comradeship with heroes and saints of every age. And so quicken our spirits that we may be able to encourage the souls of all who journey with us on the road of life to your honor and glory. This is ultimately our aim, our chief aim, that our eyes, our spiritual eyes, would be firmly fixed upon Jesus. This then, you'll notice here, becomes the topic of Jesus' very strong exhortation to the crowd. He uh, uh, says there, if you look down with me at verse 29, crowds are increasing. Um, probably the uh, same sort of series of events here. Uh, last week we uh, saw him casting out a demon. This often drew a great crowd. Here the crowds are increasing even more. Uh, and he has this very strong counsel for them. You see that there? This generation is an evil generation. How would you like to start off a sermon like that or a speech like that? Why is it evil? He says it seeks a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. He says here they're seeking a sign, and this is what makes them evil. They want something tangible. They want some proof. They're looking for some pie-in-the-sky sort of Monty Python type of uh, a miracle, a hand coming down or, or some great uh, thing like that as if casting out a demon is not sign enough. And, you know, Jesus is essentially saying here, I mean, what good would that do? How, how often do you hear that from the secular world? Well, if God would just show himself to me, then I would believe. If God would just do this or that or make himself known, what more does God need to do to reveal himself is really the question here. He says, you seek a sign. Why do you seek a sign? Because of unbelief, ultimately, what's the source of their unbelief? Well, it, it's multifaceted. But part of you has to say that, that one of the reasons why they're seeking a sign after such a great sign has been given, um, you ever think sometimes it's just too good to be true? I think I hear this a lot, actually, among unbelieving uh, family and, and friends and, and people I interact with. Uh, I think we even read a quote a number of, of weeks ago by a French philosopher saying that this is really the, the main objection to the gospel is it's just simply too good to be true. Uh, I had a friend uh, recently I was talking to who, who has a, a business where uh, he goes into coffee shops and uh, helps them, consults with them on where to position things and how to uh, uh, you know, increase business and whatnot. And he was telling me a story about how uh, he had the opportunity to open his own coffee shop uh, way back when. He said as they were preparing to open this coffee shop, uh, an interesting thing happened. They had um, a band and, and sort of brought uh, a lot of attention. This was, this was pre-COVID, of course. Um, and uh, uh, 
he said for, for about two and a half hours, all the drinks were free in the, the coffee shop. He said they had a tip jar there, and um, so the, the, in that two and a half hours uh, was the, the, the most tips they ever received uh, in uh, sort of the five year existence of this coffee shop. He said the reason that was, was because he realized that people struggled so much with getting something for free. They couldn't handle it, in other words. Uh, uh, it was too good to be true. They had to pay it back somehow. And so in the tip jar, the money went, and he said it was incredible the amount of money that piled up in the tip jar in just two and a half hours. I think the gospel is oftentimes like that to us ourselves. Maybe we're not seeking a sign in uh, sort of silly, intangible ways, but we are seeking other signs. We, we want to somehow pay for it. We want to say to God, no, no, it, it, it can't just be free. Let me pay for it somehow. The end shows this great lack of faith that we have. And so the message to these uh, uh, people in the crowd seeking for a sign, saying it's too good to be true, is, is the same. That is given to you and I this morning, struggling with uh, the, the free gift of the gospel. I'm not going to give you a sign. You have to believe that this is the truth. But notice how he does it, too. It is very, very interesting. He, he doesn't just say there's no sign given. He just simply says, I'm not going to give you another sign. You have all that you need right here. And then he gives us these two examples of signs that, that you and I both have. It's the same that they had back in Jesus' time. This is the first sign is, is Jonah. Uh, I don't know when the last time it was you read Jonah. I would encourage you to read the book of Jonah. It's only four chapters long. It's a, an easy read. Uh, but you remember Jonah's uh, mission was to go. He's called by God. He's living in the northern kingdom of Israel. He's called to go and, and preach to uh, the Assyrian Empire, this powerful juggernaut uh, world power at the time, breathing down their necks. And he's to go to Nineveh and and preach. Jonah refuses. Uh, he's thrown overboard, uh, swallowed by a great fish, and three days later the fish vomits him up upon the shores of Assyria, and he goes into Nineveh, and you recall the message that he went there to preach? Right? Uh, God is love. Uh, he loves you unconditionally. Just do good and do well, right? That's, that's not Jonah's message. Jonah's message was, quite simply, yet in 40 days, and Nineveh will be destroyed. Not really beating around the bush there, was he? 40 days from now, Jonah, Nineveh is going to be destroyed. Therefore, repent and trust in God. And you recall what happened. We're told that all of Nineveh repents. I mean, this would have been a huge city at the time. Uh, uh, all men, women, children, and, and beasts, just for effect, they throw that in, that, that, that repentance was had by all. It's a glorious scene, tremendous revival in just a short period of time breaks out. People repented in sackcloth and ashes. As they're cut to the heart, to the very essence of their being, crying out for forgiveness. Richard Sibbs uh, defines gospel repentance as this. He says, gospel repentance is not a little hanging down of your head. It's a working of the heart until your sin becomes more odious to you than anything punishment for it can bring. I think that's very apropos. That sin is something, it becomes something so odious to us. We can't abide the habit in our lives any longer. I don't know if you've ever experienced or smelt anything odious. Growing up on the farm, I, I'll never forget the smell of uh, uh, what I call spring soybeans. 
You ever smell spring soybeans? These are soybeans that were harvested in the fall that somehow fell through the cracks, and I remember just this black paste that would form underneath uh, the silos, uh, the, the ones that sort of fell by the wayside. I don't know what happens to soybeans over the course of the winter, but as they rot and decay and ferment, uh, it, it is a smell that you will never forget. It is an odious, offensive, disgusting smell that once you have experienced it, you never want to go near spring soybeans again. This is what, what Sips calls true repentance, is, is that we see the sin in our lives that we would repent of it, cry out to God for forgiveness. Know that you are forgiven of it, but then that that sin would become so odious to you that you would do anything to get away from it and get it out of your life. Have you experienced repentance like this in your life? So this, this, is, this is what Jesus says is, is one of the signs that the Spirit of God is in you. That, that sin is, is, is becoming more and more of a burden. It becomes more and more, little by little, more disgusting to you. You can't abide to have it on you or in you any longer. This is the work of the Spirit of God in the hearts of all that He calls to be His children, that we are to repent of sin. So know the forgiveness that only Jesus brings. Second sign, he says, is, is similar. Uh, he talks here uh, about this queen of the south. You see that there in verse 31. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Behold, something greater than Solomon is here. We don't know exactly who the Queen of the South was. Most likely, uh, it was the uh, Queen of Ethiopia uh, at the time. And I went on uh, Google Maps this week, typed in the capital of uh, Ethiopia, and uh, uh, typed in Jerusalem. Apparently, it's 2,400 miles. Uh, from uh, Ethiopia's capital to Jerusalem. Uh, Google Maps says that it's approximately a, a 726 hour walk. Uh, if you walk eight hours a day, it would take you roughly three months to, to make this journey. Um, let me ask you this. How eager are you to gain to read, to memorize, to put into practice God's word, God's wisdom in, in your life? Would you walk eight hours a day for three months if you were promised that, that you would receive wisdom from God? I mean, what are you willing to do to gain wisdom, to gain biblical understanding? Because I'll, I'll tell you right now, something you all already know. You don't have to walk great distances like the Queen of Ethiopia did in Solomon's day. I mean, we have Bibles galore, and yet we simply don't read them. A Lifeway survey of evangelical Christians in America recently, I think a 2019 survey for what it's worth, uh, of even Bible-believing Christians now. Uh, asked uh, uh, about their Bible reading habits. Only 45% admitted to reading the Bible once a week. And there's no sort of, I mean, that could be just a simple proverb, once, once a week. Uh, of those surveyed, a uh, full 40% admitted, uh, and that includes some of these 45, uh, to uh, occasionally reading, maybe once or twice a month, a full one in five, 20% of all evangelical Christians in America admitted that they never read their Bible. 20%. That's stunning. That's, that's 
It's not good. Here's what Jesus is saying is, is, is that is there a desire to change? Is there a desire to grow in your faith? To know more about God? Take your Bibles. And, and if you are struggling, if you're in any of those percentages there, pray to God. Ask the Holy Spirit to, to ignite in you a, a greater desire to read and to know and to memorize God's Word. So what Jesus is saying is that, that this is the proper response to the word of God. And as you pray, I mean, let me just take this even a step further. As you pray to God and ask him to give you a desire, a, a greater love for his word, be precise in how you do it. I mean, this, this is quickly becoming one of my sort of buzz phrases here, but... But have you noticed this? Because I've certainly noticed this in my, my life. That things don't change in what I'm going to call fuzzy land. Things don't change in, in fuzzy land where, where we just say, yeah, I'm going to read the Bible more. Yeah, or, no, 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 I'm, I'm firmly committed and I'm going to read the Bible much, much more. Let me challenge you on that. And ask you, when? When, when is that change going to happen? This afternoon? Tomorrow? Okay. Tomorrow, great. What, what time tomorrow are you going to start reading the Bible tomorrow? And, and, and what's your plan going to be? Are you going to read a chapter a day? Two chapters a day? Three? Uh, I mean, it's long been my practice to read three chapters a day and five on Sunday. You realize you'll read the entire Bible in a year if you uh, take that up, but, but maybe more. But, but what is your plan of action here? Be specific in that. Things don't change in just the fuzzy nebulous of, oh, I'm going to change. And then uh, I would further add this. Who's going to hold you accountable to that? Find somebody in your life, somebody that loves you enough, and, and just say to them, hey, here's my plan. Starts tomorrow. I'm going to read three chapters a day, and I want you to, to, to send me an email every other week. Ask me how I'm doing. Keep me accountable. Uh, you know, if you want, email me. Uh, I'll be glad to do that for you. In fact, those are good emails that, that you get on Monday morning as a minister. A lot of bad ones you got on, on Monday morning, but this is one of the good ones. I, I, would, I would gladly embrace that for you. Things don't change. In fuzzy, I mean, and, and this is the same for, for us as a whole. You battle sin in your life, be specific. Seek out good and godly examples and, and ask them to hold you accountable as well. Be specific in how you are going to change. Incidentally, it's the same for churches as well. We've written a very detailed philosophy of ministry statement. I mentioned it at the beginning. It, it's, it's, it's ambitious, sure. But again, Things don't change in fuzzing land. We're not specific about that. And so let me remind you again, April, come and be a part uh, as we, we hope to share this vision some more with you and develop it more as, as to what the future looks like here at Good Shepherd. Third and final thing Jesus shows us here is light. You'll notice that uh, in verses 33 through 36 again. He gives a, a very simple uh, illustration. It's, it's fascinating, isn't it, that, that Jesus oftentimes uses very simple examples, but, but go right to the heart of the matter. And he says, no one after lighting a lamp, verse 33, puts it in a cellar or under a basket, but on a stand, so that those who enter may see the light. Your eye is the lamp of your body. When your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But when it is bad, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, be careful, lest the light in you be darkness. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, it will be wholly bright, as when a lamp with its rays gives you light. I want to say just three things very briefly, and we'll be done here about light. First of all, you know, notice the singular effect here. 
It's not talking about a great fire. It's not talking about some great beacon of light here. It's a simple lamp, a candle. Notice, I, I think, what he's encouraging you to do here. The power of one light shining forth into the darkness. And days are quickly coming for us here in America when we're going to have to realize the, the power of one light. For your uh, call to stand alone, maybe. And to shine your light continually out into the darkness of this world. Notice another thing about the power of one light. Um, uh, the, the, the context of, of Jesus telling this here is within the home. I think there is some application there as well that the, the light that we shine, the light of Christ, uh, goes into the home first of all, and from there it radiates out further and further. Could it be that this is a great call again to fathers as leaders in the home? To husbands as leaders of your marriage? To be a producer of light? To be putting off sin in your life? To be a, a, a disciple of God's word? So that light might shine from you Second thing to notice about this light is the source of all true light comes from Jesus alone. Jesus is the, the, the source, ultimately. He's the one that gives light to you to lead your marriage, to lead your family. He's the one that gives you light to lead uh, in your community, in your church, to, to go out and to be uh, a light and casting out darkness. Jesus is the source of all true light. And the third and final thing to, to say about this light of Christ is that we are to be constantly looking to the light. Right? I mean, that's, that's what he's saying here is that, that your eyes are healthy when the light is shining. Therefore, do everything in your power to make sure that this light continues to shine brightly. If then your whole body is full of light, having no part dark, that is, sin, putting off sin, repentance, right? We talked about that already. It will be wholly bright, as when a lamp with its rays gives you light. We're to constantly be looking to Jesus, constantly looking to him, constantly examining our own hearts uh, according to who he is. How do we know who he is? How do we know uh, of what he was like? We again go back to the fountain. We go back to the word of God. Constantly looking to Jesus again and again and again. Because you know something in the new heavens and the new earth. He is. We're going to see that. Jesus is the light of the world. That all our eyes will be firmly fixed upon him. That when you breathe your last in this world, where will your eyes be if your faith is in Jesus Christ? Firmly fixed upon him, you breathe your last breath in this life. And the next breath you take, your eyes are firmly fixed upon him. Glorious promises, and we all leave you with this. Fanny Crosby, the great uh, uh, hymn writer, uh, one time uh, was uh, leaving a church service, and as I guess ministers sometimes do, a minister said to him, to her, uh, I think it is great pity that the master did not give you sight when he showered so many other gifts upon you. I'll stand up for the preacher. He was well-meaning, I think. Here's what Fanny Crosby responded at once. Uh, as she had uh, heard such comments before. Uh, do you know that if at birth I had been able to make one petition, it would have been that I had been born blind? Uh, she apparently went blind her first six weeks of life, and here's why. She said, because when I get to heaven, the first face that I shall ever gladden my sight will be that of my Savior. Let's pray together. Father, we confess that uh, we indeed 
have uh, are oftentimes taken our eyes off you. But we thank you that you continue to shine your light upon us, and uh, we pray now that that light uh, coming from you would radiate uh, uh, through us and bring uh, uh, light to the darkness in our lives and our families' lives and uh, the lives of, of those in our community and, and on and on we go. Uh, we pray that uh, you would uh, keep us uh, firmly committed to you uh, until that day that you uh, come back or call us home. And may our uh, hearts delight uh, in knowing uh, that uh, one day soon uh, our uh, eyes will be firmly fixed upon uh, your glorious voice. Continue to encourage us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's uh, stand and sing our closing hymn together. Let all things now be. <laughs>